Hello, everybody. We're going to get started today on our fourth webinar this week. Today's theme is all about horseshoe crabs. We're sorry that we can't be with you in your classroom today, but we're very thankful for Zoom and YouTube for being able to put these webinars out this week. Um, if you are on YouTube, just note that um, we will be checking in on the comments, but we will be having to check in at them at the end. Um, if you are on Zoom, please only use the chat function for ocean-related questions and comments, and we will be having a Q&A at the end of the presentation. So for those of you who haven't joined us yet this week, um, Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids um, is the organization putting these together. We call ourselves OPAC for short. We travel around mostly Massachusetts teaching K through 12 marine science, art, and advocacy workshops. Our mission is to empower youth, so you guys, to become curious ambassadors for the environment through the arts. So unlike a lot of other ocean organizations, we try really hard to get you guys to become the voice that the ocean needs through art projects. And we have a really fun story prompt for you at the end of this lesson. I'm going to have our co-founder join you here for a moment and tell you how OPAC started when she was a child. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for being here. This is really cool that we can do this um, via the internet. <laughs> so my name is Melanie, I am the other co-founder of OPAC, and I'm just gonna tell you a little story about how this started. Um, you're looking at a picture of myself when I was about 10 or 11 years old. Um, and when I was a child, I grew up in New Jersey along the Jersey Shore. So the ocean and sea creatures and the beach was very much a big, big part of my life. Um, if you grew up near the water, you can probably relate to that. Um, but um, I learned in school at around fifth grade about plastic pollution and ocean pollution. And that summer, my close friend and I noticed along the beaches of our very small town that there was a lot of plastic littering the beaches or plastic floating around the waterways and the rivers um, in our area. And it upset us a lot because we were two kids who absolutely loved dolphins and sea turtles and all things sea creatures. So it really hurt our hearts to see that there's so much plastic pollution um, just in our neighborhoods. So what we did is we um, decided to make our own homemade magazine to spread awareness about plastic pollution. So what we did is we stapled a bunch of line paper together and we named the magazine Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. We drew pictures of ocean creatures. And I also um, got a disposable camera and walked around my town and took pictures of sea creatures or plastic that I found um, along the beaches and we would put that in our magazine magazine too. Um, later on, I went to college speak to, to become a music teacher and um, OPAC was always on my mind. Ocean conservation was always on my mind, even though I was um, pursuing a music career. So I just want all of you to know that my message to you is no matter what you end up doing, you can become uh, an actor, an artist, a doctor, whoever you are, whoever you um, decide to be when you grow up, no matter who you are, you can still be an advocate for the ocean. And I encourage you to um, learn as much as you can and let your curiosity lead your way. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for telling us your story. Uh, I encourage all of you guys to write the next chapter of OPAC's magazine. Maybe you can learn a little bit today to help you do that. So we will be learning about horseshoe crabs and their amazing story today. We're gonna learn a little bit about their history, their life cycle, um, how they molt, how to properly flip them over if you find them upside down at the beach. We're gonna learn a little bit about their anatomy, the importance of their blood to us as human beings. 
And then we're going to be really lucky to read an excerpt of a book that one of our board members has written all about horseshoe crabs. It's called Nelson Telson, The Story of a True Blood. Um, and you can actually purchase that on Amazon uh, using Amazon Smile and help uh, us at OPAC through that purchase. So let's get started. The horseshoe crab. So when most people see a horseshoe crab for the first time at the beach, they kind of freak out. It is really creepy. It's crawling along. It has this sharp looking tail and people think that it's gonna sting them or stab them. But in reality, it's not scary at all. Horseshoe crabs can't hurt you. They don't want to hurt you. And they are really majestic, amazing creatures. And I hope by the end of this, uh, you'll be as in love with them as we are. Uh, so believe it or not, horseshoe crabs are not crabs at all. They're actually in the family of arthropods. So they are more closely related to scorpions and spiders than they are actually crabs. Um, and because of that, they, they molt their shells. And the example I like to show when we're at the beach, if we have like a green crab or a blue crab next to a horseshoe crab, is that if you were to walk up to a crab, blue crab, green crab, and see which way it would walk, it, it usually retreats backwards at you to stay defensive. Horseshoe crabs move forward, um, which we're gonna get into a little bit later as they molt. So again, horseshoe crabs are not crabs, even though I'm gonna probably call them crabs throughout this entire presentation because that is their name. Uh, horseshoe crabs have been on this planet for about 500 million years. And a lot of people call them a living fossil, which I appreciate the name of because they have been around for so long, but I don't want you to think that the horseshoe crabs that we see on the beach today have been alive for 500 million years. Um, it's just that these awesome crabs, these horseshoe crabs, they haven't really changed their appearance in about 350 million years. So the ancestors of the horseshoe crabs that we find today on the beaches um, pretty much resemble what we would have been able to see 350 million years ago, which is about 150 million years before the dinosaurs were even on this planet. Um, it, it's amazing how little they have changed in such a long period of time. Uh, there are four species of horseshoe crabs that are out there. Uh, the one that we think of in the United States is um, right here, number one. It's on the, the East Coast, but there are three other species that we can find in Asia and India. And I just like to point that out because some people think that the only place that you can find horseshoe crabs um, is in the United States, but that is not true. So the life cycle of a horseshoe crab. This is a really awesome picture of horseshoe crab eggs. And the life cycle of a horseshoe crab starts off with a, an adult female coming up to the beach at a full moon and laying about 4,000 eggs at a time. And when female horseshoe crabs are laying eggs, they can deposit multiple or spawn multiple times on a beach. Um, so they can, when they're laying those eggs, lay up to 100,000 eggs in one spawning cycle at about 4,000 eggs at a time, which is amazing. Those eggs do have to stay wet to survive, um, to hatch out of their shell. And that is why they spawn so many because most of them don't make it. We'll learn a little bit about where some of those eggs go later. Uh, those eggs take about two to four weeks to hatch and they come out on a full moon at a high tide so that the uh, larva horseshoe crabs can make it out into the water and hopefully make it into their adulthood. Uh, in the early years, a horseshoe crab spends most of its time in tidal flats and it's kind of moving itself out into deeper waters. We actually don't know a lot about the early years of horseshoe crabs and why they go so far out. Um, but in the first year of their life, they molt six times, which means that they uh, grow out of their shell six times as they're getting bigger. And their entire life, 
it can molt up to 18 times. And for males, the last time that they molt, uh, they actually kind of get these little boxing gloves that I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, and that happens during their last molt of their life cycle. Uh, horseshoe crabs don't reach sexual maturity until about nine years old. Uh, so it takes them a long time to get to the point that we usually see them on the beaches. Uh, the horseshoe crabs that we see are usually sexually mature, especially the males. And after they are sexually mature, they can live for about another 10 years. So horseshoe crabs can be about 20 years old when they pass away of natural causes. Uh, there is a lot more information about this life cycle, and I have some links for that for you at the end of the presentation. Uh, so this is a really cool video, and it's about a minute long, but I think it's worth watching. So this is a horseshoe crab from an aquarium uh, in England that is molting or molting its shell. So it's coming out of its old shell and growing. And you can see that it's coming out from the front end. Um, so they, if this is, this is a model of a horseshoe crab. So they are coming out from the little lip on the front of their shell. And again, they can do this. They have to do this about six times in the first year of their life. And they can do it up to 18 times during their life cycle. And for a few hours to a day after they come out of that molt, uh, they are pretty fragile. So they are much more susceptible to being eaten by predators. Uh, horseshoe crabs don't really have a lot of predators other than humans, uh, but things like sharks and turtles could crash into their shell uh, when they are soft out of that molt. But really many things don't eat horseshoe crabs because they don't have a lot of meat. So if you do find a horseshoe crab when you're on the beach, oftentimes uh, they are upside down because they've been crashed in through a wave. And you can see that on the picture here. And most people's reaction is to pick them up by their tail. And you do not want to pick up a horseshoe crab by its tail because you can break that tail. And the tail is really important to help that horseshoe crab swim when it's in the water. And horseshoe crabs actually swim upside down, so their tail is acting like a rudder. Um, that tail is also really important for helping the horseshoe crab naturally flip over when it's on the beach. Uh, so if you do grab it by its tail, you can you can break that tail, and then we call that tail the telson. And if the telson breaks, the horseshoe crab will have a really hard time when it's swimming and trying to naturally flip itself over and bury itself in the sand. So when you do find one upside down, you just wanna come up to its side and you just wanna casually flip it over by its shell and let it uh, crawl away. And again, they're, they're not gonna hurt you. Uh, they, they're not poisonous. The, the only way you can hurt yourself on a horseshoe crab is by putting your hand on its sharp parts, but that would just be silly. So we don't wanna do that. So again, if you find a horseshoe crab, that is alive on the beach upside down. Don't pick it up by its tilson. Uh, fun little fact, if you are on the beach and you find what you think is a dead horseshoe crab, it probably isn't a dead horseshoe crab. It's probably one of the molts that we just saw. Uh, the easy way to tell if it's a molt or if it's a dead horseshoe crab is by smelling it. If it's really, really stinky, it's probably a dead horseshoe crab. If it's not really stinky and it's really light and fragile, it's probably one of those molts. And the molts are really cool because they leave behind pretty much a perfect skeleton of what the horseshoe crab would look like, including its eyes, which we're gonna talk a little bit about um, in a minute here. And you can put those eyes under a microscope and see uh, all the little details of them. So what do these horseshoe crabs eat? Uh, horseshoe crabs actually are not picky eaters at all. Uh, but because they live on the ocean floor, they eat the things that live there. So small clams, um, think of razor clams and little baby cohogs, uh, crustaceans or shrimp and um, little worms like polychaetes that live on the bottom of the ocean floor. Uh, horseshoe crabs do not have teeth, so they need to crush their food. And we're gonna learn a little bit about their anatomy, but they basically take their little legs and they push all the food towards their mouth 
And to break up all those hard parts, horseshoe crabs actually have gizzards, just like chickens, to break up hard pieces so that they can digest the food. Uh, horseshoe crabs don't just eat things that live on the ocean floor, they often carry many travelers with them. Uh, horseshoe crabs are the home for many ocean dwellers. And you can take a, a look here at our illustrations. We have things like barnacles, uh, mussels and sponges and baby oysters. Uh, we have different shrimps and leeches. Uh, so horseshoe crabs are really important for the entire benthic or um, ocean floor community. So the uh, anatomy of a horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are super cool for so many reasons, but one is that they have this really simple uh, body structure. And again, we, we have our telson, the tail. Uh, we have on the top of the horseshoe crab, we have a few different eyes. I'm gonna talk about all of its eyes in a second. Uh, the figure you're looking at, it, so that it is the top of the horseshoe crab and the, the bottom half of that figure is what, if you were to take the, the top layer of this crab off, what it would look like. So you would have that gizzard that I was telling you about um, and you have its brain and you actually have um, a heart, so this is flipping over, that runs the entire length of the horseshoe crab, in, not including its telson, but the whole uh, prosoma, the front part of the horseshoe crab here, there's a, a heart that runs the whole length of its body. Uh, these horseshoe crabs do have blue blood, which we're going to talk about in a minute because of the copper in them. And on the bottom half of the figure that you're looking at, uh, we're labeling the legs and the first set of legs, which are, I'm going to get this, which are up here. Uh, these are used for placing food into the horse crab's mouth. The pedipals, they are our ambulatory legs, the legs that help the horseshoe crab move, uh, which, and then in the center of all those pedipals, we have the mouth. And then we move down here, and these are the book gills of the horseshoe crab. Uh, so our gills, just like our fish, um, help these horseshoe crabs breathe when they're in the water. Um, horseshoe crabs do need oxygen to survive. However, we see horseshoe crabs on the beach a lot, and horseshoe crabs can survive up to four days if, they're satch if their book gills are saturated with enough water without going back into the ocean. Uh, so they can survive four days on the beach without going back into the water if their book gills right here have enough water in them when they leave the ocean. Uh, the heart of the horseshoe crab beats about 32 times a minute, which is pretty cool. And one of my favorite things about the horseshoe crab anatomy are its eyes. Our horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes. Uh, so they have two eyes that we would think of as humans as eyes, and those are their lateral eyes, which are the ones right up here uh, that look like eyes. And behind those two lateral eyes, there are some rudimentary lateral eyes. So that gets us to four eyes. We have the endoparterial eye, which is on the, the front end of the shell up here. Um, we also have two median eyes, which are below that. And then if we flip our horseshoe crab over, uh, it says two ventral eyes that are on the figure here, but those are actually down near its mouth. And then the tail of the horseshoe crab is lined with what we call photoreceptors, um, which are pretty much what the rest of the eyes minus those lateral eyes are. They're light sensors. So the horseshoe crab can see light and dark shadows so it can find its food. The lateral eyes that we think of as like human eyes, compound eyes, we believe that those are mostly used for mating. And if you are lucky enough to find a molt on the beach and find it under a microscope, kind of look like fly eyes. And you can see some better pictures of those at um, horseshoecrab.org. So there are a lot of different ways to tell the difference between a male and female horseshoe crab. Uh, there's a 15 second video here that's gonna show you most of them, but the one that they do miss 
is that if you look at the front edge of our horseshoe crab shell, uh, which is the frame that's here on the screen right now, you'll notice that the male has a little bit more of a ridge than the female. And that's one easy way to tell the difference between a male and a female without picking them up. Females often are, are always larger than um, males at sexual maturity as well. So let's see the other ways that we can tell the difference between a male and female horseshoe crab. Do you know how to tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab? Females tend to be larger, while males tend to be smaller and have a boxing glove shaped claw or clasper and the front claw that they use to hook onto females while spawning. I'm just gonna play that one more time because I think it's worth seeing those uh, boxing glove claws because that's the number one way that I always find the difference between a male and a female. Because uh, if you're if you're just at the beach and you're trying to find a horseshoe crab and you pick it up the right way by the side of its shell and you flip it over, um, there's no stop. It's hard to tell if it's smaller or larger because there's only one horseshoe crab around. Um, and when it's in the water, it's hard to find front edge of its shell. Uh, so. Do you know how to tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab? Females tend to be larger, while males tend to be smaller and have a boxing glove shaped claw or clasper and the front claw that they oh. Sorry, I was trying to pause it for you. The clasper right there looks like a boxing glove. Um, so that's the number one way to tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab and the if you remember from a few slides ago, when the horseshoe crab, from the horseshoe crab's life cycle, the males don't develop that until uh, their last molt in life when they become sexually mature. Uh, so one of the really cool things about horseshoe crabs, which I think is uber relevant right now in our crazy times, uh, is their, their blood. Uh, it is blue and that's because of the copper that is in it instead of iron like our blood. And I have um, a good video here for you about why that horseshoe crab blood is so important. But basically, if you've been to the doctor's office, you are thankful for horseshoe crabs, um, which again, I think is very relevant right now. So I'm gonna show you this short video about why horseshoe crab blood is so important to us. During the warmer months, especially at night during the full moon, horseshoe crabs emerge from the sea to spawn. Waiting for them are teams of lab workers who capture the horseshoe crabs by the hundreds of thousands, take them to labs, harvest their cerulean blood, then return them to the sea. Oddly enough, we capture horseshoe crabs on the beach because that's the only place we know we can find them. A female horseshoe crab lays as many as 20 batches of up to 4,000 eggs on her annual visit to the beach. When the eggs hatch, the juvenile horseshoe crabs often stay near shore, periodically shedding their shells as they grow. Once they leave these shallow waters, they don't return until they reach sexual maturity 10 years later. Despite our best efforts, we don't know where they spend those years. Though we've spotted the occasional horseshoe crab as deep as 200 meters below the ocean's surface, we only see large groups of adults when they come ashore to spawn. Horseshoe crab blood contains cells called amoebocytes that protect them from infection by viruses, fungi, and bacteria. Amoebocytes form gels around these invaders to prevent them from spreading infections. This isn't unusual. All animals have protective immune systems, but horseshoe crab amoebocytes are exceptionally sensitive to bacterial endotoxins. Endotoxins are molecules from the cell walls of certain bacteria, including E. coli. Large amounts of them are released when bacterial cells die, and they can make us sick if they enter the bloodstream. Many of the medicines and medical devices we rely on can become contaminated, so we have to test them before they touch our blood. We do have tests called gram stains that detect bacteria, but they can't recognize endotoxins, which can be there even when bacteria aren't present. So scientists use an extract called LAL 
produced from harvested horseshoe crab blood to test for endotoxins. They add LAL to a medicine sample, and if gels form, bacterial endotoxins are present. Today, the LAL test is used so widely that millions of people who've never seen a horseshoe crab have been protected by their blood. If you've ever had an injection, that probably includes you. How did horseshoe crabs end up with such special blood? Like other invertebrates, the horseshoe crab has an open circulatory system. This means their blood isn't contained in blood vessels like ours. Instead, horseshoe crab blood flows freely through the body cavity and comes in direct contact with tissues. If bacteria enters their blood, it can quickly spread over a large area. Pair this vulnerability with the horseshoe crab's bacteria-filled ocean and shoreline habitats, and it's easy to see why they need such a sensitive immune response. Horseshoe crabs survived mass extinction events that wiped out over 90% of life on Earth and killed off the dinosaurs. But they're not invincible, and the biggest disruptions they've faced in millions of years come from us. Studies have shown that up to 15% of horseshoe crabs die in the process of having their blood harvested, and recent research suggests this number may be even higher. Researchers have also observed fewer females returning to spawn at some of the most harvested areas. Our impact on horseshoe crabs extends beyond the biomedical industry, too. Coastal development destroys spawning sites, and horseshoe crabs are also killed for fishing bait there's ample evidence that their populations are shrinking. Some researchers have started working to synthesize horseshoe crab blood in the lab. For now, we're unlikely to stop our beach trips, but hopefully a synthetic alternative will someday eliminate our reliance on the blood of these ancient creatures. TED-Ed is a nonprofit, and this video would not exist without the support of our incredible community on Patreon. You can learn more here. So I think that's a, a really great synopsis of why horseshoe crab blood is so important to us and why those amoebocytes are so uh, complex but simple at the same time uh, and why we rely so heavily on them. There's a wonderful book written by William Sargent called Crab Wars. And if you want to learn more about the early on research and bleeding efforts of horseshoe crabs, that is a great resource. And it also talks a lot about the legislation that's happened to protect horseshoe crabs from bleeding efforts over the years. Um, horseshoe crabs, when they are taken from their habitats, often aren't returned to the habitat that they came from as well. And one uh, good piece of evidence for that is their size. Uh, so horseshoe crabs on the east coast of the United States are found um, as far south as Florida and all the way up into Maine. And they kind of have a, a, a bell curve as they go down the coast. So the largest horseshoe crabs that we find are in Delaware in the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, they can be um, 18 inches to two feet wide. So their, their shell here can be really large. And in uh, northern and southern, so north of the Chesapeake and south of the Chesapeake, they get smaller again. Um, so if a lot of the bleeding efforts actually did happen in the Cape Cod area and in the Virginia area. And all of a sudden there were horseshoe crabs that were much larger than they should have been in those areas. Um, and they did have pretty high fatality rates. And again, I will link that um, book to our website, but it is called Crab Wars and it's written by William Sargent. And it can go into all the details of those bleeding efforts. Another uh, wonderful thing about horseshoe crabs is that they provide eggs not just for their own survival but for the codependence of our migratory birds. Uh, so there are birds that travel upwards of 5,000 miles every single year traveling from South America all the way up to the Arctic. Um, some examples of those are on the left of the screen here. We have um, red knots, rudy turnstones, and sandpipers. Uh, which are three common examples that we would find in Delaware, in the Delaware Bay and on Cape Cod coming up this time of year, actually, in um, mid to late May, our horseshoe crabs 
come up onto the beaches to lay all of their eggs. And these birds can eat enough of those eggs that have been unburied and dried out that they can double their weight in about a week or two, well, two weeks, sorry. They can double their body weight in two weeks just by eating horseshoe crab eggs. Uh, this little clip here that I showed you is from an awesome film about horseshoe crabs called Crash a Tale of Two Species. It's from PBS, um, and you can find that online as well. Uh, but our, over the last decade or so, we have seen a lot of studies that show with decreasing horseshoe crab populations, we're also seeing decreasing migratory bird populations because there hasn't been enough food for them to eat. So what are some threats today to horseshoe crabs? The number one threat and pretty much the only threat are horseshoe crabs. I'm sorry, two horseshoe crabs are humans. Um, and that is, there are a couple of things in the video that showed you there on beach development. So if we're destroying habitat where horseshoe crabs need to come up when they spawn to, to lay their eggs, uh, they can't keep reproducing. Uh, we have a lot of recreational vehicle traffic Humans love to go to the beach. We love to bring our four wheel drive vehicles out so we can have all of our coolers and our tents and everything on the beach. But oftentimes we destroy the eggs when we drive over their habitat. Uh, some things offshore oil spills can uh, pose threats to young horseshoe crabs as they're um, molting and growing. Bleeding is definitely one of the largest threats to horseshoe crabs. We're physically taking horseshoe crabs from their habitat or taking their blood and re returning them um, with pretty high fatality rates. And less so now, but more so um, around the first turn of the century, so late 1800s, early 1900s, we caught massive amounts of horseshoe crabs. There was a period where we caught 400 mi sorry, 4 million crabs um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s for uh, bait and fertilizer. So horseshoe crabs were crushed up and either planted for crops or used as bait for eel and elk fishery, whelk fisheries, not elk. Elks don't live in the ocean, whelk. <laughs> um, so now I'm gonna have Melanie come back over here and we are super lucky to have uh, Heidi Mayo uh, our board of directors at OPAC, and she has written a wonderful book called Nelson Telson, The Story of a True Blood. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you can find this resource for free right now on her website, which I've linked on our website. Uh, she's made this available right now so that everyone at home can continue to learn about our wonderful environment. Um, but if you'd like to have your own copy, hard copy, you can go on Amazon Smile and purchase this and uh, support OPAC while you do that. I'm gonna have Melanie come over here and she's just gonna read you a short part of the book so that you can uh, get inspired to read the whole thing. All right, hello again. Um, so this is what the book looks like. This is Nelson Telson. And uh, cozy up, I'm going to read you um, a bit of the first chapter here. And the first chapter is called Nelson. It was the end of August, and the sky was clear back to school blue. Mariah's mother had parked on the bay side of the beach in the lee of the dunes to keep out the steady breeze. The sand was warm and golden, but a snap in the air signaled summer's passing, sending a shiver of goosebumps across Mariah Miller's tanned arms. She was going into the sixth grade this year, into a new school, in a new town, in a new state, knowing no one. The first day loomed closer as the air got drier and the sun sank lower. She kept imagining that first day of school, being forced to stand up and introduce herself to the class. She had done it so many times before in other classrooms, in other towns, in other states. Each September of her life, her, her cheeks got red just thinking about it. Glistening sunlight sharpened the tips of the beach grass as they danced in the breeze that swept Mariah's hair across her face. 
When she stepped over a mound of dried seaweed, something crunched under her foot. It was the dried shell of a baby horseshoe crab, all golden and crinkly. She hadn't noticed them before, hundreds of small crab shells thrown about in the seaweed like meatballs in a big pile of black pasta. She was collecting the golden shells along the edge of the marsh grass when she spied something interesting. It was a flat, it was flat and shiny and had edges that came to a point. An arrowhead. She turned it over and over in her hand, feeling how it had been smoothed by time. She ran to her mother's beach chair. Mom, she said, opening her hands. Look what I found. Mariah's mother sat back in the chair with a big fat novel that she had been reading for the past few days. Since she hadn't lifted her head away from the page, Mariah thrust her hand between her mom's sunglasses and the book. Hmm, said her mother. Mom, said Mariah, it's an arrowhead, you know, from the Indians who lived here long, a long time ago. Actually, it's a spearhead, said her mom, peering over her glasses and squinting at it. Arrowheads are smaller, and we don't call them Indians anymore. Indians are from India. Your spearhead belonged to a Native American. Her mother took the stone from Mariah's hand, inspected it for a moment, and handed it back. Very nice, she said, returning to the book. Mariah held the spearhead tightly in her fist as she explored the marsh. Out of the corner of her eyes, she thought she saw something moving down by the water. When she looked up, she saw nothing out of the ordinary, just some dark rocks scattered in the muddy sand. The tide was low, so it wasn't the small rippling waves farther out or the white glint of a seagull coasting in the distant sky. Thinking how pretty they'd look all lined up on the mantle of her new bedroom, she gathered the shells until her hands and arms were so full, she dropped one or two every time she bent down to pick up another. Combing the tide line for a littered plastic bag or some other container to put them in, she found the perfect thing half buried in the blackened heaps of seaweed. It was the hollow shell of a big old horseshoe crab, strong and rigid, dark as ebony. Wherever she looked, she saw more and more shells, but something kept drawing her attention back to the water. She left her crab bowl up on the beach and headed down to investigate. Splashing through a tidal pool, she stubbed her toe on a rock and the spearhead flew from her hand and landed in the wet sand. She limped over to find it, pointing like an arrow on a map. It directed her eyes across the sand to an upside down horseshoe crab that looked like a jagged rock with 10 wildly wiggling legs. It was rotating its tail, which was not long and pointed like other horseshoe crabs, but broken off at the end. It was attempting to flip over and drawing a design in the damp sand that looked like a quarter moon. As Mariah reached down to pick up her spearhead, she heard a small deep sound coming from the animal. At first it sounded like bubbles popping, but then she thought she heard it say, help, help. Gently, she flipped it over. If she didn't know better, she could have sworn she heard it say, thank you. Looking around to make sure no one was paying attention, she leaned down closer, inspecting the broken tail. Looks like you broke your sword, she whispered. She always talked to animals that way, but never expected them to talk back. Not a sword, the voice creaked. It's a Telson. Mariah smacked her forehead with an open palm. Oh my gosh, she thought I'm crazy. Mariah, her mother called. She was so startled by her mother's voice. The spearhead popped out of her hand again. Put your hat on, dear, she said. Mariah leaned down and whispered to the crab. Oh, what then? All she could hear was a bubbly sound. She must have imagined that it had talked. Silly, she thought. Of course the horseshoe crabs can't talk. Her mom glanced up from the book and called down to the water again. Your hat, please. Ever since her mom had a cancerous sore blamed on the sun removed from her nose, she was always lecturing Mariah that it's never too early to start caring for your skin. Okay, Mariah said. Disappointed, she reached down and picked up her spearhead. A Telson, said the creature. Mariah's eyes widened as she looked at the spearhead in her hand. She placed it carefully on the sand. Could you repeat that, please? 
All she heard was the lapping of small waves. She picked up the spearhead again. It's the Telson, said the creaky voice. That is what my tail is called. Oh my goodness, she said, shocked that she was actually talking to this animal, worried that she was crazy, but liking it so much that she wanted to keep the conversation going. She clenched the spearhead in her fist. How did you break it? Break what? Your tail, or your telson, I mean. I didn't break it, I sacrificed it in an act of altruism to a beakless, great blue heron who was now forever grateful. Mariah was flabbergasted. The crab went on about the importance of giving to those in need while Mariah shut her eyes as hard as she could and then opened them slowly to make sure she wasn't dreaming. She stood there shaking her head in disbelief. A talking horseshoe crab and a philanthropic one at that. Her mother had just said that word the other day, philanthropic. She said it meant showing concern for others and giving to charity. Giving half of your tail to a beakless er heron certainly was philanthropic. She tried to imagine the heron, such a majestic bird, its long neck poised elegantly above the water with a horseshoe crab's tail for a beak. Well, if she was going to be talking to a horseshoe crab, she might as well ask, how did you attach it to the heron's mouth? I didn't, it said. Some muscles pitched in and the sandpipers helped. They are very helpful birds, you know. Mariah listened in disbelief. It was too incredible. The horseshoe crab went on chatting as if it talked to kids on the beach every day. Sandpiper? She had seen a small brown bird scampering about the shore and now it was telling her that they were helpful? What's next? She looked at the spearhead in her hand. Wait a sec, she said as she knelt down and put it on the sand. Sandpipers, she said again. All she could hear was a bubbly sound. She snapped the spearhead up in her hand. Very helpful animals, she heard it say. They glued my half tails into the heron's beak stub with the adhesive muscles used to stick themselves to rocks and to each other. It is one of nature's strongest glues, you know. They tied it with a string to hold it until the glue set. They found the string on a stale balloon that landed on the beach. Wow, was all Mariah could say. Now when he dines, Aaron, that's his name, stabs a fish with his prosthesis, flips it into the air, and sends it right down his gullet. The horseshoe crab seemed happy to have someone to talk to, someone who listened attentively. It told Mariah that most creatures don't listen very well at all. Mariah, you're hot, dear, her mother called from the beach chair. In a minute, Mariah said impatiently. She didn't want to move. She was afraid to take her eyes off of that animal for fear it would crawl back into the bay and disappear forever. So that is the portion of Nelson Telson that I'm going to read to you. If you are interested, you can go on our website. And I think Jeffrey mentioned that Heidi has made this available on her website for free. So if you're interested in finding out what happens in the rest of the story, uh, go check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie, for reading. And thank you, Heidi, so much for making that available. And um, these are a list of some follow-up activities that we have for you. Um, you can submit questions um, as they come to you later on on our Facebook page, um, or you can send us an email. Um, if you don't like us on Facebook, I highly suggest doing so because we are gonna be posting um, our future webinar information there as we have it. Um, we have made a worksheet for you to write your own horseshoe crab story. Um, and then there's some information about our contests and follow-up reading on our website as well. Um, now I'm going to take a little bit of time here to do a Q&A for you. Um, so if you have a question and you are on Zoom, now is the time to ask it. If you're on YouTube, um, we will try and answer your questions following this live broadcast. Um, so if you have a question, you can put it in the chat or Q&A function. Um, I see the first question here. It says, what part of New Jersey? I know this is from a while ago. Uh, Melanie grew up near Sandy Hook in Highlands, New Jersey. Um, 
I see where is the sharp part of the horseshoe crab. So the tail stem of the tail, or the tail right here, uh, it, it's sharp. Um, Native Americans used it as a spearhead, um, but it's not going to hurt you unless you hurt yourself with it. Um, so don't be worried. Horseshoe crabs aren't going to hurt you. Um, why do horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes? Well, there's not a lot of light on the bottom of the ocean floor and they use those eyes to find food and see shadows and make their way up to the beaches so that they can mate and spawn and create more horseshoe crabs. Um, if you find a molt on the beach, is it okay to pick it up or should it be left alone? If it's a molt, uh, pick it up, investigate it, become more curious about horseshoe crabs. Uh, like I said earlier, they're pretty much a perfect skeleton. Um, so it's a, a good way to learn about the anatomy of a horseshoe crab. What happens if a horseshoe crab loses a tail? Does it grow back? Um, I don't believe they, they grow back, no. So we wanna be really careful when we're on the beach. We don't wanna pick up our horseshoe crabs by their telson. We wanna flip them over by their shell. Does anyone farm horseshoe crabs for their blood? Um, many, 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 many people farm horseshoe crabs for their blood, um, but by farm, uh, they just go out to the beaches and take them because they're plentiful. Do horseshoe crabs have stomachs? Yes, they do. Uh, there's an awesome diagram of their digestive system on horseshoecrab.org. How are their eyes on their molt? Uh, so the, the compound eyes, the lateral eyes up here, um, they're really cool on the molt. You can see pretty much the whole structure under a microscope. Um, how do horseshoe crabs eat if their mouth is on the bottom? That's an awesome question. So if I'm a horseshoe crab and my hand's gonna be the ocean floor, um, think about where clams and worms and uh, little shrimp live. They all live on the ocean floor. So our horseshoe crab is crawling along and that's why their mouth is underneath um, so that they can push all the food into their mouth. Um, and they don't have teeth, remember, so they take all that hard stuff and they digest it through their gizzard. Um, what places in the United States can you find horseshoe crabs? Um, up and down the east coast of the United States, you can find horseshoe crabs. Uh, what is the boxing glove leg used for? The boxing glove leg on the male horseshoe crabs is used to latch onto uh, female horseshoe crabs during mating season. Do horseshoe crabs eat while they are swimming or do they crawl up onto the beach? Um, horseshoe crabs do neither. They eat while they're still in the water, but while they're crawling on the bottom because that's where those uh, shellfish and crustaceans and worms are. Uh, why do the eggs hatch in two or three weeks? Uh, it just takes a long time for them to develop. If the horseshoe crab goes in the water for a second and then back on land, will the four days restart? That's a great question. I don't know how long they need to be back in the water. Um, so those book gills that they have, they need to be pretty well saturated for them to survive for four days. And um, horseshoe crabs don't often spend four days on land. Uh, that's just probably during their mating season. Can horseshoe crabs only live in the Pacific? Uh, horseshoe crabs don't really live in the Pacific. They live more in the Indian Ocean um, around China and Japan. Uh, so in the seas over there and um, on the east coast of the United States. When the horseshoe crabs are harvested, are they captured after they have spawned? Um, they, there's no easy way to tell that. Um, we do capture more female horseshoe crabs than male horseshoe crabs because they're larger and they have more blood. Um, so chances are that they haven't spawned or that um, they won't be able to again after being bled. Uh, do horseshoe crabs dig holes to lay eggs or do they lay them right on the beach? Um, they don't dig, they kind of crawl into the sand and lay the eggs because the eggs have to stay wet so they are buried in the sand. 
Um, I see a couple questions about um, moratoriums for fishermen on harvest. Um, I would encourage you to look into your local regulations for that because um, those do change up and down uh, the East Coast. Would the blood that scientists are trying to make be exactly the same as the actual blue blood from horseshoe crabs? So that's a great question. Uh, they're not trying to make blood per se. They're trying to make the enzymes that are found in the blood. Uh, it, and that would be pretty similar. It would be a synthetic version. Think about like your synthetic medicines that you can find. They're trying to, to replicate it so it can do the same thing. Looking through here. Do we ever use the molt for jewelry or other stuff? That's a really great question. I haven't seen them used for jewelry, um, but they are often used for art projects. Um, if you find a good molt and you let it dry out, you can uh, put the varnish and stuff on it and it will keep that shell preserved for longer for you. Um, I have quite a few of them. I live near a beach. My mom says it used to have tons of horseshoe crabs, but now we're lucky to see one or two a year. Why? That's hard to know without knowing the specific place that those crabs, where, where they are. But my guess is that we've, A, harvested a lot of them for either bait or bleeding. And as our climate changes, their habitat is changing and we are starting to see influences on their habitat as well. There's an article on our website about horseshoe crabs in Pleasant Bay in Massachusetts that might explain that a little bit more for you. Why do people call horseshoe crabs crabs? At, because they do kind of look like a crab. They have legs, they crawl on the bottom. Um, but again, they are not crabs. Uh, they're more closely related to scorpions and spiders. If the population of horseshoe crabs is decreasing, why do we still harvest their blood? Um, because we are super reliant on the lysate that we synthesize from their blood um, for our medical techniques. And until they find a synthetic version, um, we, we do rely on that to stay safe ourselves, which is unfortunate, um, but a lot of people would say necessary. I'm going to take two more here. Um, how did the horseshoe crab get its name? Um, that's a great question. If you look at the shell here, it looks just like a horseshoe, um, like your horseshoe games. What did you say that you put on their molts to preserve them? I put varnish on their shells to preserve them, the molts. One more here. Um, why do 15% of the horseshoe crabs die after getting their blood harvested? So 15% is an estimate. I've seen many estimates that go way higher than that. And Imagine yourself getting a lot of blood taken and then trying to go right back into the ocean after being harvested. Um, they're, they're losing a lot of their oxygen and nutrients. Uh, they're losing their own defensive enzymes and they're out of the water for a long time. Uh, so they're often harvested, put in trucks, brought to the bleeding centers, bled, and then put back in trucks and oftentimes 
return to a new habitat? Um, so these were all really great questions. Um, and I encourage you, if we did not answer them, to shoot us the question on Facebook or send me an email. I will try and answer all of the questions that I get. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, I am just going to put up one more slide here for you, um, just to give you the information on where you can find everything again. So um, there's a link to our website in case you lost it. Um, and we are able to offer all of these webinars for free, thanks to some generous donations from our past supporters. Um, and we would like to keep offering all of these distance learning opportunities over the next couple of weeks as everyone is still out of school. Um, so if you can offer anything to help us keep doing that, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, and until next time, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you soon.